Good afternoon and good evening. Um, my name is Edward Luce. I'm Associate Editor of the Financial Times, and I'm delighted to be here at this Commonwealth uh, Club of California event to talk to Thomas Wright um, about uh, his new book, which you should all uh, read as, as well as buy, because you can't read unless you buy it, Aftershocks, Pandemic Politics and the end of the old international order. Uh, it's a great book. I have actually read it now, and um, I strongly recommend it. Uh, Tom's an old friend, but he knows that, um, you know, if, uh, if a friend writes a, a mediocre book or invites <laughs> me to have a conversation with him um, at the Commonwealth Club of California and I don't like the book, then I will quickly find a dentist's appointment or an uncle's funeral as an excuse. And this isn't one of those um, instances. Uh, it's a very timely book. Uh, it looks at the um, international context for how the world handled and is handling or mishandling the pandemic since 2020 uh, and um, what the likely geopolitical long tail um, of this is going to be. Tom uh, is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he's a contributing writer for uh, the Atlantic Monthly. Um, he's written a previous book that came out in 2017, All Measures Short of War, which in many ways is a precursor to this one because it looks at the new era of great power politics. So it's a great pleasure to be here in conversation with Tom. Tom, let me start by asking you, um, you mentioned in the book and in some of the articles you've written around the book that uh, 2020, the beginning of the pandemic, is likely to be one of those um, strong years in history, in modern history, much like 2008, the financial crisis, 2001, 9-11, 1989, the end of the Cold War, that this is a, um, a seminal date that we should pay attention to. Could you just elaborate on what what is so paradigm shifting uh, about COVID-19. Yeah, Ed, thank you so much. And it's great to be doing this with you. And thank you too to the Commonwealth Club of, of California for the opportunity. Um, yeah, I think, you know, when you look at when Colin and I, this book is co-authored with, with Colin Cobb, when we spoke sort of, you know, in May, April, May of last year about doing a book, I think we thought at that time that 2020 was an incredibly important year because it was a year in which there was a global crisis and there was no international cooperation. Instead, there was nationalist governments, you know, populism, authoritarianism. You know, many world leaders weren't even speaking to each other. And we thought this was sort of interesting to document and study in real time to see how the world would cope. And having been through now 2020, I do think that it sort of lived up to that sort of rather gr uh, grim billing um, because uh, it, it really did, I think, um, show us, you know, the cost of a global crisis without any cooperation. It, ex it dramatically accelerated U.S.-China rivalry, and it will have repercussions in many parts of the world that don't get a lot of attention, you know, like the developing world for many years, if not decades, um, to come. And I think it also sets the stage for dealing with future pandemics and where the global sort of health system is a zone of contestation between the major powers. So I think it will be um, what one of the, it may not have been in the book, but might be in one of the articles, you know, in the same way that the Cold War was shaped by the events of 47, 48, 49, and that mattered, future rivalries and competitions will be shaped by the events of 2020, 2021, and maybe beyond. So a lot of people, you know, among whom Richard Haas of the Council of Foreign Relations have said that this pandemic accelerated pre-existing trends. Um, but I think you're going a step further and saying it actually created a, a, a new trend in terms of um, the nosedive in US-China relations. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Yeah, I think the, there's something to the acceleration you know, argument, and particularly with the US and China, I'll come back to that in a second, but I don't think it really captures everything. You know, populism was on the rise 
prior to COVID and arguably, and we can talk about it, but arguably COVID set it back, you know, as a setback for Trump. And so it might have, you know, actually reversed a trend in the case of populism. Now, some of the populists, as you know, like Bolsonaro are relatively popular coming out of the pandemic, but it was a big stumbling block for those populists that were in power. So in that sense, it wasn't sort of an acceleration of a trend. Um, in the developing world, it reversed you know, decades of poverty alleviation and sort of plunge those countries back. So, uh, so to me, I don't think acceleration, you know, really captures it. Where it might be most applicable, you know, is with sort of the U.S. and China. But even there, you know, a dramatic acceleration, in my mind, is not the continuation of a trend. It's a dramatically different, you know, scenario. Because if you if you move the tape forward you know, very rapidly, that has a momentum and a character all of its own. And I think that's sort of what happened in 2020 with the with the U.S. and China. And I think in China's case, we, we might come to this in a second, you know, it actually reversed 17 years or so of reforms on global public health, where it was actually being more cooperative, relatively more transparent for the most part with, with some bumps, you know, throughout that period. And what 2020 was to did was bring that to a halt and reverse it. So I, I think it is a separate, you know, dynamic um, and not just a continuation of what we had previously. Uh, I'll get in a second to the um, sort of subtitle, the end of the old international order. Um, but just on the, the US China um, stuff, you've got a lot of fascinating material there. Um, about China's lack of cooperation with the WHO, um, Trump's, uh, you've got a very salty, I'm not sure what the, the, the language rules are on the, the Commonwealth. Yeah, we, but probably, there's uh, probably a fa- family audience, so we should have the audience. president's quotes, yeah. <laughs> so Trump says something, uh, uh, um, you know, very spicy about what Xi Jinping has done to him and to, to him personally. Um, but talk to us a little bit about what you discovered in terms of WHO politics. In, in Trump's case, you know, the shock to him of having to shut down the economy really caused him to turn with a vengeance on Xi Jinping and endorse those in his administration who wanted a more uh, comprehensive containment approach. Um, but at the WHO, which was your you know question, this is really fascinating, you know, that the WHO in January finds out that they uh, really have this global crisis. And on the one hand, they have a, a, a dictator in China who they believe is less uh, willing to tolerate any type of criticism from the international community than the Chinese were uh, in 2003 with SARS. And on the other hand, you have Donald Trump, right? And in the middle of this, you have the director general, Ted Ross, who basically uh, believes in his own power of persuasion. And he thinks he can sort of navigate this by personal leader-to-leader diplomacy, and he will praise the leaders publicly in exchange for, uh, in the hope of getting incremental, concrete cooperation, you know, uh, in a practical sense. And that leads him to say certain things uh, in January about China that are manifestly at odds with what the WHO's own assessment is. So he says they're fully cooperating. It's a perfect approach, but privately, from documents that have been reported on by AP and others, um, we know that 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 was not true. And that really led the US to react with fury and to say, no, you have to, if not criticize them, at least accurately describe what they're doing. And if you actually falsely praise them, that's counterproductive. And that set the stage for this epic battle, which in some part was a comedy of errors you know, on on all sides where the U.S. actually tried to withdraw from the WHO in the middle of a global pandemic, which, of course, is just an astonishing, you know, thing to thing to do. But throughout it, you know, Ted Ross was really trying to stay close to the leaders and try to work the system to get some cooperation. But there was an enormous gap between that and what was actually needed. So the um, I mean, if you're head of the WHO, if you are the WHO, This is a pretty sobering case study, and it would apply to any other multilateral institution of just how disabled and paralyzing it is to have your two biggest members at loggerheads and worse with each other. Um, If you 
in any way, and I know you are, but in any way a believer in multilateral cooperation, what lessons can you can you draw from the disabling of the WHO? I think one thing we learned was that global public health, and I'm, I'm sure the people who you know worked on this all along knew this all along, but it may be one of the most sensitive areas of international cooperation. You know, we like to think this is a common challenge, so we should work together and it's easier than cooperating on North Korea or Afghanistan. But actually, you know, it is sort of about getting into the sovereignty of other countries, inquiring about why they had no outbreaks, how they handle that, you know, demanding levels of transparency about regimes that can be pretty secretive. And all of that came to a head here. Uh, and I guess what, what the lesson to me is that, you know, there's absolutely no reason to believe that if there's a future pandemic that may be worse, that China's behavior or the behavior of others will be different. You know, it's not as if there's a rethink in China, you know, boy, we handle that WHO part badly. You know, they sort of believe they handle it pretty well. There has been a rethink in America where you have a president who's rejecting the previous president's, you know, attempt to pull out. But the previous president or someone like him could well be empowered the next time, you know, as well. And so I think the lesson for me is that, you know, we should work with the WHO, but we can't count on the WHO actually being effective because we can't count on China's cooperation. And we can't even fully count on the U.S. being supportive either. And so if if there's one big sort of takeaway from the book, I think it's that, you know, nationalism and rivalry are not necessarily going away. Like we have to, we should try to change that if we want to change that domestically in our own countries. But we need to be ready for a world, you know, that is very problematic, you know, politically speaking, and and prepared to deal with these really difficult challenges, you know, despite those constraints. Now, I should should have mentioned at the beginning that um, we will um, have Q&A later, but it'll, it'll be me reading your questions. So please, if you want to pose a question to Tom, um, put it in the text uh, box on YouTube um, and they'll be relayed to me. Um, so is it fair to say, given that China still hasn't fully fessed up, if you like, all the data or anything like all the data that um, that it must have had December, January and even beforehand of 2019, 2020, that we still can't rule out a lab leak? Yeah, we we sort of... You know, this is one of the most sensitive issues, obviously, out there. And we really talked about how to deal with this. And we 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 agreed on a few things, or we knew a few things for sure. The first is that we're not scientists and we weren't going to play scientists in the book. You know, we weren't going to try to assess the science on either side. Um, so we didn't do that. But what we did do um, after talking to a, a number of you know experts from all, and officials from from all different sort of interested parties and uh, you know uh, the WHO, the US, some other governments, um, was that we and this is the position of the WHO currently as well. We don't have the evidence to be able to make an assessment, and so given that from a matter of policy, we should proceed as if both theories are true. Right? We should be worried about a zoonotic event, animal to human transmission, and we should be worried about a lab leak in the future. Um, And so if if we don't have enough evidence, we basically have to prepare for both eventualities because both are are plausible um, from a a public policy perspective. Um, So that's sort of where we come out. But I think it is a plausible theory, but we just haven't, you know, the, the, the experts have not seen the um, the necessary uh, information and data to be able to 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 make a to draw a conclusion, and that that actually is the director general of the WHO. That's his position as well now. I mean, it, it strikes me that you know, if uh, if if there were a lab leak, China would would be incentivized to cover it up, and therefore a lot of people are deducing, maybe incorrectly, that um, the likelihood there was a lab leak is higher than if China had cooperated with um, with the WHO and other investigations. Yeah. I mean, has is there any, uh, which, which therefore makes this a, a pretty irrational um, act on China's part, a, a self-defeating one. Is there any sign that China 
acknowledges that and might be learning from it? There's no sign that they're acknowledging it. No, I mean, I think there's, it's obviously, as, uh, as you know, no, I, you know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult to draw a, a judgment from the failure to cooperate because, you know, like in Iraq as well, leaders can have odd reasons for not cooperating with inspections. Um, but, you know, it, it's definitely not positive that they're, that they're failing to cooperate. To me, I think the main takeaway I draw from it is not whether or not it makes a lab leak more likely or less likely. Um, it's that we're not getting cooperation from China and we shouldn't expect to have transparency in the future. That's the sort of policy takeaway. And the and the 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 implication of that then is what do we do about that? <laughs> you know, so so that that I think is more important actually than where it came from. Um, because we we should know now that in a future contingency like this, we won't have cooperation either. And so we need to be prepared to act um without their cooperation, one way or the other. Um, or to accept that we just won't have it. And so I think that's what people are sort of, it's staring us in the face, but I think people are sort of avoiding it as well because they're getting, you know, so focused on the question of was it a lab leak or was it a zoonotic, uh, you know, transmission. Um, and and we, may, we may never know that. We should continue to look and continue to press. But we do know, you know, that the, the reason why we don't know, which is that there was a failure to cooperate. It sounds almost Rumsfeldian. We do know the reason why we don't know, but which is a very good way of looking at it. Um, the um, last telephone call that Trump had, as you report, uh, with Xi Jinping was that spicy, unprintable one that were well, followed by his, his spicy, unprintable comment in March, late March uh, of 2020. Um, followed then by an extraordinary sort of propaganda, counter-propaganda campaign between the Trump administration and Xi Jinping's people, the wolf warriors saying, actually, this was a virus that came, that might well have come from the United States, um, uh, and that it's fake news that it came from Wuhan. And then the Trump administration, Mike Pompeo and others, branding it China flu, the China virus, um, and implying very heavily that this was perhaps even a biological weapon. Um, what did uh, this sort of quite sinister, fake newsy um, sort of war of propagandas between China and the United States tell you about the strengths and weaknesses of, of each country? I mean, the, the most remarkable thing was that, you know, you have in the middle of a global pandemic, where there's virtually no international cooperation, you have the two leading powers engaging in different ways with, you know, their primary objective is disinformation, you know, and a propaganda war, which is just, you know, I think to, to most other countries seemed absolutely crazy. You know, when you have the Secretary of State, there were like there were legitimate questions about the investigation. And there were legitimate questions about the official story, and the lab leak is a plausible you know, hypothesis. But to have in the middle of a pandemic, the US Secretary of State basically blow up different international meetings, like a G7 ministerial, because the other ministers won't use the words China virus in the communique, it just boggles the mind, you know, given that there's so much that needed to be done. And I think that was what upset the Europeans and others who believed, you know, to the extent there are legitimate questions, those can be dealt with. But we are actually in the middle of a global pandemic. So can we also talk about that? Can we talk about, you know, diagnostics and treatments and, you know, vaccine cooperation and COVAX and helping the developing world and, you know, on the economic side? So all of these things um, basically were, were, were set aside. And I think that was the that was the most remarkable thing. The other thing, just on the China side, was it really was a shift in their um, in their propaganda uh, technique. You know, the, it became more Russian. You know, the Putin mo is basically to say, well, you're saying this about me, but I'm saying the same about you. You know, you say it was a lab leak. Well, I'm saying it's Fort Detrick, and I'll come up with some stuff on that. They used to not really do that, and they embraced that fully. Now and it was quite counterproductive. I, I mean, I I always think that it's it's more interesting to compare its effect on Europe than the United States. You know, because Europe 
was actually appalled by what Trump was doing in many respects. You know, they were quite open to working with China on the pandemic and China's actions and its world warrior diplomacy and propaganda during the course of the pandemic hugely alienated them and caused a real change in Europe in terms of their attitude towards China. Uh, and so that, I think, gives you a clearer sort of illustration of how counterproductive it actually was. And of course, Australia, you know, which initially called for the international investigation, suddenly had whatever exports to China yeah. banned, wine, uh, to uranium, whatever it might be, they just stopped buying them. Right. And, and it, Australia was a really interesting canary in the coal mine throughout in terms of, you know, U.S.-China relations throughout 2020, because China kept tightening the screws on them because of the call for the investigation and also because of a number of other things that they were that they were doing in, in terms of, you know, combating political interference and, you know, and, and on the 5G side. So um, so there was a that was that was very tense. Um, throughout the throughout the year, and then of course Australia had its own, you know, unique, almost unique experience, which is continuing with COVID with this very severe set of travel restrictions and lockdowns. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that we know that China isn't going to cooperate. I mean, that's the sort of actionable um, actionable takeaway from this: that China isn't going to cooperate with future such investigations. Um, is that a point that's just confined to the origin of um, viruses and pandemics, or are you making a broader point about China's more general non-cooperation with the international community? Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's possible they'll cooperate on mo- on some things, um, but I think it's worth preparing for the possibility that they won't, right? I think on the transparency for investigations, it's very clear that they that they won't or that they don't want to. Um, but on other aspects of a pandemic, we should test the hypothesis, but we should also have a backup plan. Um, but if you look at just, Ed, if you just look at the last month even, um, it's quite interesting. You know, the Biden administration has reached out you know, the Biden administration has a tough position toward China, but they've also reached out via, you know, the Deputy Secretary of State and John Kerry and and even President Biden in the phone call last week to emphasize that even though the U.S. is competing with China and in a rivalry, the two countries should cooperate on shared sort of existential questions like climate and pandemics. And the Chinese position at every level has been, you know, not so fast if we're to cooperate with you, you need to unilaterally create conditions through which the relationship is is more friendly so we can cooperate. So we don't agree that we'll just cooperate on issues where we have a shared interest if you're doing what you're doing on Taiwan and Hong Kong and Xinjiang and trade and everything else. Um, and that 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 is the current position. Um, and so, you know, we should try to change that and we should engage you know, them in the hope of changing their minds. And it might change next year after the 20th Party Congress. But we also need to be ready that if they don't change their mind, you know, that we can tackle these shared problems without their full participation in cooperative endeavors. Um, you know, so I'm not saying we shouldn't try. I'm saying we should try. But we also need to be ready that if their their future answer is what their current answer is. So, I mean, you, you chronicle very well in your book the, um, how U.S.-China relations under Trump nosedive really significantly after Trump realizes that this pandemic isn't a hoax, that it really is going to necessitate a shutdown, uh, a lockdown in the U.S., and therefore his re-election hopes are um, in jeopardy. Um, and that at that point onwards, the China hawks, you know, basically, uh, you know, who'd been arguing but not always winning in the White House, from then on, they won. But you also make the point that Biden inherited that and hasn't really changed it. Um, so if you're China, maybe that's what you're looking for. You, you just mentioned, you know, the Chinese have been linking cooperation to changed U.S. behavior on other fronts, human rights, Hong Kong. Um, maybe that's what the China, Chinese are looking to see, setting the clock back in U.S.-China relations to pre-pandemic. Yeah, I mean, I think it, the roots of it were there before the pandemic, you know, and they may have ended up in a similar spot, you know, to, to some degree 
Um, but I think they did hope, you know, they could change it back. But I, I think the one point, though, and, you know, we're careful in the book not really to criticize, you know, the administration for being for, for being tough on China in, in some of the respects that it was. I mean, there were elements of the rhetoric that I think were off, you know, but some of it was, you know, justified. And it was a response to what China did, you know, so... Um, you know, China did fail to sort of refuse to cooperate. It did become much more assertive. It did crack down in Hong Kong. And so even though Trump sort of changed because he felt politically affronted, um, China was giving plenty of reasons to the international community to respond in that way. And I think by the time Biden came in, you know, for, for, for President Biden, I don't think it was obvious that he was going to pursue a very tough on China policy. Um, but I think when he came in, the situation was such, you know, that that was what he was presented with, that he had he had Chinese activity in a range of areas that he felt was unjustified and he needed to to push back. Now, the big question is, how do we get to, you know, that, you know, equilibrium where you can compete uh, responsibly and you also have scope for some coordination? You know, there are some boundaries on the competition and that's the big challenge I think they and you know China have is to try to figure out how to get to that point. Um, and we're not there yet on it. it. It could take some time. Uh, I mean, I do want to ask non-US China questions and, and maybe um, uh, the viewers do too. And as I said earlier, they can post questions. Um, uh, but just sticking for a second to the, the US-China situation, but how it looks today from the Biden um, administration's point of view, because Biden has stressed, as you mentioned, that we're going to compete and cooperate, that there's rivalry, but there's also potential working together there. And that's the sort of fairly complex, nuanced approach that Biden wants um, to take to China. In the meantime, we have a world where, you know, the OECD, the wealthy countries, including for the most part, the United States are getting vaccinated. Um, but the developing world is woefully behind. Um, uh, you've got 90% um, uh, of shots in people's arms basically taking place in, in, in wealthy countries. Um, isn't this an area where there is competition between China and the US? The Chinese are um, leading in that competition and maybe the Russians too. Their vaccines are aren't nearly as good as the ones developed in the West, but they're sending a lot more of them abroad. Isn't this a problem for the West? Yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem. You know, the, the and, and, and not, to be honest, like not just, and not primarily geopolitically, but from, as you know, as I'm sure we both agree on that, like it's, it's, it's a human problem. And yeah, it's also a geopolitical problem. But first and foremost, I think it's a, you know, it's a it's a global public health problem. And it just it boggles my mind, really, that, you know, the IMF estimates that the cost of the pandemic uh, will be around or just over like tw I think it's 22 or 23 trillion dollars between the start of the pandemic and 2025. And when you think about that number, which could well grow, the um, the, the cost, the marginal cost of vaccinating the world, we're talking about tiny amounts of money, you know, in comparison with the overall cost of the pandemic, and certainly in comparison with the pandemic continuing and variants emerging that are resistant to vaccines and it continuing for many years. Um, so we should be willing to, you know, throw everything at this in terms of getting the world, you know, vaccinated. And it's not just about sending vaccines. It's obviously also about, as one of your colleagues wrote about, the other day uh, in the Financial Times about distribution, you know, about getting those systems of distribution around the world. And I think this vaccine summit is a great sort of start on that. But we have to really, you know, put our not just money, but our resources where our words are. Um, I just leave you one one thing on this, that at the G7 meeting, you know, there was much hullabaloo was made about the fact that the G7 was agreeing to send 870 million new vaccines around the world. 500 million of those were from the US, 370 were from the rest of the G7. Um, and the WHO estimated that we need over 11 billion 
And that was before all the call for boosters. So it's less than 10% of the total. And we were, you know, patting ourselves on the back for, you know, this extraordinary act. It's a good start, but it's only it's only a start. And we have a narrow window here. If we if we don't get this done in the next year or two, then, you know, it, it's going to be too late because there will be variants uh, beyond what we've seen now. And a lot of these you know problems are really have consolidated in the unvaccinated world. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me as, um, you know, in soccer times, a wide open goal that America could put the ball in, into. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the International Monetary Fund estimates that it would cost $50 billion to vaccinate 60% of the world by mid-2022, which would be an ambitious but achievable target if it were a priority. Now, $50 billion is less than... President Biden is proposing to spend on Amtrak modernization. Um, so you you refer to the vaccine summit next week, which is very good news. Biden is calling a virtual summit of international leaders, including Xi Jinping, we assume, uh, next week. Um, uh, can we expect pledges like that, plausible rather than sort of paper pledges like that, um, in your view, from, from the Biden administration and its partners? Yeah, I don't think they would have agreed to to do a summit without having big proposals ready. So I'm sure there will be significant proposals, you know, for and commitments, you know, forthcoming. Um, and you know, around the time of the UN General Assembly is the right time to do it. Um, and so I hope they do turn to that. I think the problem is is that, you know, and this was the situation from the start when when President Biden took office. The domestic challenges are so all-consuming, it can be easy to think of this problem as a foreign assistance development problem, as opposed to an existential challenge. You know, it's actually not a matter of being generous. It's really an additional front in that wider war on COVID-19 and on the the pandemic. And so I think it will be interesting to see what they come up with. And it's not just you know, it's not just Biden. It really is also, you know, I think the EU, uh, you know, Japan and, and many others that, you know, we all need to significantly, you know, up our game in this. And just in terms of the Chinese and Russian part, you know, I think this is one area where competition is positive. Like if they can get vaccinations out, you know, that's a good thing. And they may not work, you know, the Chinese ones may not work as well, but they're better than, you know, nothing. So I, I think we should not be, you know, discouraging that we should be trying to up our game to get more vaccines, you know, distributed uh, and in shots and arms. Um, but hopefully others will be able to do that, too. Uh, now, l- let me just change the focus a little bit. Um, you-, you mentioned that before the pandemic, when there was global assessments were done of each country's preparedness for a, a health emergency on this scale, the best in the world, number one, was the United States. And uh, number two was the United Kingdom. Um, now, yeah. clearly, in practice, they weren't very well prepared, or at least if they were, they didn't do much with the preparation that had been done because they, these two countries are notoriously amongst the worst on the mortality uh, list. So has this pandemic taught us to be a bit less complacent about how good we are? And has it changed your view of you know what, what we think we know not necessarily being what we do know. It's been a revelation, right, as, a, as, a, as an event, because it just like uh, folks say, you know, the saying that war reveals the true balance of power and before, before a major conflict, you know, we may have an inaccurate assessment of which country is actually stronger. The pandemic had the same effect uh, on all of us. So pretty much every country you know, either did consistently badly or had moments that they did very badly and moments they did better. Um, and that was sort of repeated, you know, through the United States at moments where it was doing quite well and the vaccine development, you know, Europe in the summer of 2020, but then plenty of troughs after that. Yeah, so that's, you know, it, it's a very, very good point that Boris Johnson and Donald Trump are both populists. Um, but it, Italy had, you know, a technocratic government. Um, 
plenty of countries um, elsewhere in Europe, Sweden included, had what was considered to be very high quality governments, um, but also performed badly. So is it fair to say populists have been more damaged than other forms of politics by this pandemic, or is it more complicated than that? And I, and I appreciate you, you mentioned Bolsonaro remains as popular in spite of everything in Brazil as he was before his own version of denialism. Um, but what can you draw sort of broader conclusions about the effect yeah. on populism? Yeah, I think it's, I just made two points. One, I think the type of governance mattered, but it's interesting if you compare the EU to the US, basically at the end, near the end of the pandemic, when we are, you know, hopefully at a, a better moment, it's not over obviously, but at where we are now, um, the number of deaths in the EU are higher than in the US and adjusted for population roughly the same. So you have these radically different approaches and you end up netting out at sort of the same level. Um, so that's, you know, that's just interesting um, and, uh, and suggests that, you know, despite all of these different experiments, you know, within the US and within Europe and also between them, you know, didn't make a huge difference in terms of where it netted out. Um, for the populace, um, I think their incompetence was sort of displayed and the denialism, particularly with Trump and Bolsonaro. But what we didn't anticipate was that they also tapped into a part of the population that didn't want the restrictions or felt the cost was excessive. The cost to their livelihoods were excessive. They couldn't Zoom. They couldn't social distance and maintain their livelihoods. They resented you know, those who were fortunate enough to be able to sit at home and work um, and they began to flock to populist leaders. And of course, you know, Trump lost the 2020 election, you know, decisively, but it was closer than many people sort of anticipated. And so uh, I think that's what was sort of the mix. And, uh, you know, Bolsonaro, as you say, uh, remained and remains relatively popular despite everything, you know, that's happened in Brazil. So I think it should give us it is a setback for populism and arguably Trump might've won the election if it wasn't for COVID. Um, but at the same time, I think it did reveal a new sort of partisan divide and a new populist centrist divide on public health and on pandemics. Uh, it, would it be going too far to say it's been a setback to the West or, or does the fact that most of the effective vaccines did come from the West um, militate against that? I think there's a few, I think there were three things that Western democracies did that nobody else really could have done. You know, the first is the vaccine development, Operation Warp Speed, which I think was extraordinary and an extraordinary combination of basically unlimited government money plus a massive pharma advanced pharmaceutical industry, mainly in the US, but also in Europe with BioNTech and you know, the mRNA technology in Germany. And um, so that that was one thing that I don't think anyone else could have replicated. And that was the outcome of, you know, so-called ne neoliberal, you know, societies and economies in the market economy. The second thing uh, was the economic response, you know, which we haven't mentioned, but this extraordinary mm -hmm. sort of central bank response, extremely swift, overwhelming uh, as you and others have written very eloquently, long-term implications that are mixed, arguably, but its effect in the short term is decisive. And the third thing that our societies did that, again, you know, China could never do was display an ability for self-correction. So we did actually you know, elect a leader who rejected the previous leader's mistakes, and that can happen in other countries also. And so there was some capacity for policy change and for acknowledging errors. And I think that's really important mm -hmm. in terms of where we go forward. Um, so I'm not so sure, I, you know, I don't really buy the, um, I, I know there's, a, there's an argument out there that because China suppressed the virus early on, it displays our um, sort of weaknesses. And there's some truth to that, but, you know, they have vaccines that aren't as effective you know they're 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 still struggling with the, with the virus, and they have really no 
the regime has no ability to acknowledge error. Uh, and so I think that makes a big uh, that makes a big difference. Do you think Trump would have been reelected without the pandemic? Uh, obviously impossible to say, but it was it was sufficiently close in the end, you know, that I think it, you know, it definitely was a was a possibility. Uh, and I think that there was huge disillusionment with his just competence in handling this pandemic. But over the fall, I think he did, you know, benefit from this counter movement, you know, in the country, which you've seen elsewhere as well, um, in terms of protests and resistance to some of the lockdown measures. So I think it did, you know, it was more complicated than, you know, the pandemic was just a, a, a net minus for him politically. So we have got some questions coming in, but let me ask uh, one more before I relay those uh, to you, Tom, um, which is you make the, the very good analogy uh, or comparison really between today and the great influenza of 1918, 1919 and say, that there are a lot of parallels, um, including the sense that the old world order is gone. And of course, that's in your, uh, the title of your subtitle um, of your book. Uh, what um, can we learn from the great influenza, which perhaps isn't, or at least wasn't until this pandemic as well known as it should have been, because it had been overshadowed by the great war. What can we learn from how to manage a disintegrating old order um, uh, from from back then, given the conditions we're facing today. Thanks. Ed. It's a great it's a great question. I think we spent you know we dedicated two chapters to that in the book because I think as we researched it, we realized that it was both very important and relatively overlooked. You know, because it was as you point out, you know, just wrapped up in the Great War and World War One. You know, the levels of fatalities were extraordinarily high, but the world was already in a terrible place. Um, and then there were many contributing factors to the emergence of fascism and the like. Um, but having said all of that, we do think it did have sort of a profound effect on that post-war period. And the main sort of, you know, and, and it's interesting, you know, the world was a lot less institutionalized then. Uh, we didn't have any of these institutions that we have today. Um, but in some respects, we weren't massively better this time than we were then either, right? I mean, the numbers were higher in terms of deaths because of particular circumstances. But in terms of the response, we weren't necessarily, with the exception of the vaccine, much more rapid. We think that the main lesson, you know, is that democracies and like-minded societies, including some non-democracies, have to work in a more concentrated way together to, and, and hold together to sort of shape that you know, post-pandemic, post-war order. And that's really what broke down in the 20s and the 30s, obviously. You know, and today, you know, what I'd say, we're not reliving the 30s, but, you know, we are going to face the, a, a, a wide array of challenges, pandemics, climate change, you know, uh, nuclear proliferation, plus great power rivalry, maybe economic volatility. We should try to work with all major powers to deal with those, but we also need to be ready you know, to work with those we see eye to eye with if those broader efforts fail. And, and that, I think, is the main lesson of the post-World War I period. Interesting. Let me move, let me move to the questions. The first is, uh, how much responsibility does Mr. Trump bear for creating the international climate of distrust and non-cooperation around the pandemic? So what share of responsibility goes to Trump? Yeah, um, we, we, I'm not sure if this is what the questioner is asking, but it, I'll just relay it anyway and then hit the broader point. There's an argument that um, with US-China cooperation, you know, that tr prior to the pandemic, that Trump pulled out a certain number of CDC officials out of China and ended public health cooperation with China, and that led to its unraveling. And, and we dug into that a lot in the book, and we talked to a lot of different um, civil servants and political appointees and others. And we sort of found it didn't really hold up because they did withdraw some CDC officials, but they were associated with PEPFAR and with HIV AIDS, and they were redeployed to Uganda and elsewhere. And there were other 
CDC officials left in place who were working on infectious disease. The relationship was negatively affected by the deterioration in relations. And so to some extent, it might have been a reaction to Trump, but it wasn't really the result of the administration deliberately trying to, you know, kneecap the, 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 the public health cooperation efforts. Um, so I think there it largely lies with Beijing. I mean, Trump is not the Trump administration is not blameless in it. Um, but I think we did see greater problems in them cooperating with the WHO in the years running up to, we try to document those in the book, in the years running up to COVID. More generally, I think he, um, I think he missed a, his big, the biggest mistake he made was February of 2020, because that was the point where he could have used that month to rally the country and the world to make the necessary investments to be ready when it spread in March. And instead, he felt that he did enough with the travel ban that he didn't need to do anything more and that he didn't want to do anything additional that could harm the economy. And there were those in the administration who told him, no, this is 1918. Literally, this is a rerun of 100 years ago. We need to be ready for it. And he told them they were being alarmist, effectively. And so I think that was his single biggest um, error, more so than you know, the press conferences and the disinformation because it had real consequence and it couldn't be reversed. That time was then just lost. Uh, next question. Communists like Xi Jinping typically don't admit their failures. Could they, I guess the Chinese, have opened a Chinese version of Glasnost or would that require a Chinese Gorbachev? Well, Xi Jinping may be many things, but he's definitely not Gorbachev. Um, I, I think they worry about uh, Gorbachev and that analogy and Glasnost. Um, we've seen a greater degree of secrecy. Um, you know, I think from their perspective and from his perspective, they've come relatively well out of the pandemic, you know, because they suppressed it. They far fewer deaths in the West. We looked very disorganized. You know, they were organized. Um, they don't believe you know, that the, the lack of cooperation is a problem. You know, they've created this narrative mainly for domestic consumption, that it's a conspiracy against them. And then they've seen an opportunity that they believe the West and the U.S. is in decline. And so I, I just don't think you see, you, you don't see, uh, as far as we can tell, just from the reported, you know, uh, dialogue, um, you don't see this considera reconsideration of the period that that was a, that was a huge error, or we made major mistakes in that, um, in the same way that you do here. So, um, you know, I, I would hope that they would have a period of reflection, you know, on you know how they handle the pandemic. But I think it's more likely, you know, certainly for a domestic audience that they push this line, that they handled it very well, and you know, we have over six hundred and fifty thousand dead now in the United States, and you know more are about the same in Europe. So, I mean, we've only got um, two, three minutes left. So let me uh, conclude with a question of, of my, my own, which is what your prediction is for this pandemic. By, by when do you think, it's sort of a two-part question, by, by when do you think this is going to be basically over and, and become endemic and cease to be a pandemic? A and B, short time to answer a big question, but what are the longer term geopolitical consequences that we haven't yet discussed? Yeah, I think I was hoping it would be over this year, but I think really, you know, we may not be out of this for a couple of more years in terms of the world being out of it, you know, so we're likely to see uh, more restrictions in place in terms of we won't be back to normal, back to pre-2020, maybe for a couple of years at least. And and that I think is is quite, you know, concerning, but I think we will be dealing with it. It will become endemic. Um, but we will also be dealing with it as a major sort of challenge requiring special responses. I think, Ed, the one thing that we, you know, maybe haven't talked about as much that is we, we did talk about it a bit in the context of the vaccines, but will be a, a major long term sort of implication is the effect on global inequality and, and the mm -hmm. fact that we may have now sort of a safe world and an unsafe world. You know, part of the world has been heavily vaccinated, part of the world that hasn't, uh, part of the world that can socially distant, can work by Zoom, 
technical problems and toddlers notwithstanding, you know, can, um, you know, can do all of that economic activity and many other places um, because of their economic models that just cannot. And uh, I, I don't think we've thought enough about, I hope this comes up at the vaccine summit, um, but I think this is in part about the type of world, you know, that we, we want to live in. Do we want to go back to uh, the type of globalized world with, with modifications and with greater management of the excesses, uh, but basically the notion that we are sort of in this together and we are connected, or are, are we likely to see the world really devolve into blocks um, that protect themselves, you know, ha, you know and, and are sort of concerned about those other parts of the, of the world outside of their block? I, I thought that was a, a really, really good um, tour d'horizon of the, the themes and also of your book that, that, that we're facing. So thank you so much, Tom, um, for being in conversation with me and to the Commonwealth Club of California, um, which um, you should visit at, um, hold on a minute, I've got to give you the correct email address, um, uh, online address, commonwealthclub.org. Sorry, uh, easy to remember. Um, uh, and um, thank you to, to, to you as well, to the Commonwealth Club, but, uh, um, and to the viewers. Bye thank bye. you. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Tom.